little early, so thank you all for being here. Welcome to the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium presented by UT Health San Antonio Cancer Center, the American Association for Cancer Research, and Baylor, Collar of Med Baylor College of Medicine. My name is Rachel Sowell Silverman. I'm the Director of Public Relations for the AACR. We appreciate you uh, joining us for this uh, conference today. This will be one of two. The second will occur to this afternoon at 7, uh, 12.15. And we're doing this because we want to make sure everyone can get to opening remarks uh, at 8 a.m. this morning at Hall 3. We will have uh, two presentations with an opportunity for you to ask questions of each presenter after each presentation at the center microphone here. We do have some reporters joining us uh, by phone today. And so um, if you are on the phone, we ask that you press star one on your keypad. Please remember to silence your cell phones and use your microphone when speaking at the conference so our folks on the telephone can also hear. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Dr. Carlos Arteaga. Dr. Arteaga is the co-director of SABCS. He is also a past president of the AACR and director of the Harold C. Simmons Comprehensive Cancer Center at UT Southwestern Medical Center. Dr. Arteaga. Um, thank you, Rachel, and good morning. It's good to see you all here this bright and early uh, for this first press conference. So uh, each speaker will have about seven to eight minutes followed by your questions and we'll try to have, a, we will have a hard stop at 7.45. Uh, the first uh, presentation is by Dr. Charles Geyer. Dr. Geyer is professor of medicine at Virginia Commonwealth University School of Medicine and associate director for clinical research uh, at the, that institution and the Harrigan Hall Locke Family Chair in Cancer Research at the Massey Cancer Center in Richmond, Virginia. Dr. Geyer, please proceed. Thank you, Carlos. Good morning. It's my pleasure this morning to introduce to you the Catherine tri Trial. This is an academic co uh, pharma collaboration between NSABP, German Breast Group, and Roche Genentech, and a lot of global uh, Catherine investigators. Catherine is a phase three study of TDM1 versus trastuzumab as adjuvant therapy in patients with HER2 positive early breast cancer who have residual invasive disease following standard neoadjuvant therapy. My disclosures are, are shown here before I begin. The rationale for Catherine was that we know that outcomes for patients with HER2 positive early breast cancer have been greatly improved with the addition of HER2 targeted monoclonal antibody therapy to chemotherapy. Patients receiving these therapies prior to surgery with clearance of the invasive cancer in the breast and with negative axillary lymph nodes enjoy a favorable prognosis. However, those patients with residual invasive disease in the breast specimen or axillary nodes have a less favorable prognosis with an increased risk of recurrence and death. Since TDM1 is active and approved for patients with HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer following prior therapy with taxane chemotherapy and HER2 targeted therapy, which <clears throat> form the basis of our current neoadjuvant therapy, Catherine investigated whether substitution of adjuvant TDM1 for adjuvant trastuzumab, which is the, has been the standard, would improve outcomes for these patients with this relative unmet medical need. The study design was, was straightforward. This was a global study, so we allowed an array of neoadjuvant therapies be administered to patients before entering the study. We, we required a couple things. They had to have central confirmation that they indeed had had HER2 positive breast cancer, and we wanted to be sure that they had received a standard chemotherapy treatment so we, that we uh, cl characterized as saying at least six cycles of chemotherapy. There had to be at least nine weeks of a taxane included in there along with trastuzumab. Uh, and, to describe the, basically the standard regimens. It was important that all chemotherapy had to be completed for surgery because we were using that biomarker of residual disease as our indicator of relative resistant uh, micrometastatic disease. Of course, we had to have evidence that the patient had residual invasive tumor in the breast specimen or in their axillary nodes, and patients began, uh, entered it and began it on Catherine 
within 12 weeks of surgery. Now, this is a group of patients with a lot of variability, so an important aspect of the study was establishing the stratification factors because patient outcomes, their prognosis is different depending on these factors. So we stratified our patients by whether they had originally presented with operable or inoperable disease, by whether they had hormone receptor positive or negative disease, by whether they had single or dual HER2 targeted neoadjuvant therapy, and then did they have disease still in their axillary lymph nodes. Our study randomized 1,486 uh, women one-to-one -to, -one to receive either TDM1 or standard trastuzumab every three weeks for 14 cycles. The primary endpoint for the study was invasive disease-free survival. We assumed that adjuvant trastuzumab would provide a three-year IDFS of about 70% and that improving that with TDM1 to 76.5% for a hazard of 0.75 would be clinically meaningful. In order to see that difference, we thought we would need to have enough accrual so we would have 384 events to give us adequate statistical power and that's where the the sample size of nearly 1500 patients came from. We did specify that when we had about two-thirds of the 384 events we would conduct a single interim safe interim efficacy analysis which occurred in July of this year and if we saw in that early analysis that our hazard ratio was under 0.73 we would report and also conduct an initial survival analysis. This is the results of our, our, our interim analysis that showed really a remarkable reduction in the risk for developing one of, these, one of the IDFS events. We had a total of 265 events, and you can see 165 of those occurred in the patients receiving trastuzumab, or 22% of that group, that was reduced to 91 or 12% of patients receiving TDM1. This corresponded to an unstratified hazard rate of 0 0.50, substantially lower than what our target hazard rate had been, which was highly statistically significant. And in an absolute sense regarding improvement, three-year invasive disease-free survival went up from 77% to 88%, a full 11% percentage point increase. Once we had, knew that there was this difference, it was important to look at how the drug performed across the various subgroups, our stratification, to see if there was consistency. And one of the remarkable findings is there really is a striking homogeneity of consistency uh, in terms of the efficacy in all these various subgroups. We see that patients derive the same benefit whether they came in with inoperable versus operable <coughs> disease, hormone receptor positive or negative, whether they got single or dual HER2 targeted therapy, and so on. We saw no differences uh, in efficacy by age and race as well. And there are some other subgroups that uh, we will be showing in the presentation. Again, this is a consistent theme, the striking uh, consistency of the <coughs> results that we saw. In terms of safety, uh, we, we basically knew going in that, that trastuzumab would be expected to have an increased uh, number of, of adverse events relative to trastuzumab. Trastuzumab is a well-tolerated drug. Well, and, and we saw this, this in our study. I think the important thing we're, uh, is to, to see that the majority of these adverse events were actually grade one, grade two milder symptoms, and these are shown in the lighter uh, colors on this, these bar graphs. The more severe grade three toxicities were, are coded for in the darker colors, and you can see that they're relatively infrequent. Now, the most common side effects that patients reported on TDM1 were fatigue and nausea. So these are certainly things uh, that can be bothersome but are generally manageable and, and reversible. The potentially serious side effects are platelet count drops and increases in liver enzyme tests shown here. We did see 6% of patients develop more severe thrombocytopenia, but more severe uh, liver elevations were really infrequent in the study. So overall, uh, this does appear to be a, a tolerable, manageable regimen. One other thing I did want to call out was that sensory neuropathy, which can be a problem for patients who have received taxane-based chemotherapies and TDM1, is we did see an increase in overall uh, sensory neuropathy from 7 to 19 percent, but importantly, 
12% of that 19, uh, so to speak, were due to milder grade one toxicity. And as we're following these patients, we are seeing substantial uh, re reversibility. So in summary, Catherine demonstrated that adjuvant TDM1 has a, both a statistically significant and clinically meaningful improvement in IDFS compared with trastuzumab. We had hoped to demonstrate a hazard ratio below 0.75, and it was actually 0.5. This, of course, corresponds to a very large and substantial absolute improvement. The benefit of TDM1 for our primary endpoint was consistent across all key subgroups. Safety data were consistent with the known toxicities of TDM1 with expected increases in manageable AEs, uh, but uh, these are things that we think are, are, would be manageable by medical oncologists and temporary and for the most part. Additional follow-up will be necessary to evaluate the effect of TDM1 on overall survival, but the strength of the data that we're seeing today uh, I think makes it likely that Catherine will form the Catherine results will form the foundation of a new standard of care in this population and will also substantially increase the use of neoadjuvant therapy in her two positive early breast cancer. I'd be happy to try and address any questions. Thank you, uh, Charles. Uh, questions from the audience, please. You can stand up at the center mic, please. <clears throat> Excuse me, Caroline Hellwick, ASCO Post. Um, is trastuzumab alone uh, typically what you would use in this population, or would it be with pertuzumab now? That would be variable globally. Uh, it, it is, uh, pertuzumab is becoming more uh, used more frequently, uh, and, and that would be now if, if you use the two dual antibodies preoperatively, they tend to be carried postoperatively. So that is, we, we, the study wasn't designed to assess that specifically, but the, you know, the fact that trastuzumab, that this drug has a 50% reduction hazard versus trastuzumab is just very unlikely that pertuzumab could have that much benefit in a group of patients who did not have disappearance of disease. That's the thing about this approach is we, we find out in the individual patients what is the activity of the combination. So basically the idea is if your initial combination doesn't clear the disease, this drug is effective in a switching strategy. Okay, one more question. Why did you have a hormone receptor negative patients in there? Well, I mean, the HER2, the, the study is for HER2 positive oh, HER2, breast cancer. I'm sorry, yeah. I'm sorry, yeah. Okay, yeah. got that. Okay, yeah. thank you. Hi, uh, Neil Osterweil with Oncology Practice. Uh, just. Which uh, trials did you use um, for the trastuzumab alone data, you know, to base your assumptions? It was on? primarily a, a study from from Michael Unch and the a German group, uh, the Techno trial, that had had looked at that that, that we used. I mean, it, it's a little bit of a a rough estimate because you never know exactly what the characteristics are of the population that's going to be on your study. So I think at, you know one of our concerns as we were crewing our trial was we did see that we had a greater number of patients with relatively small amounts of invasive tumor. And so we, we had the concern that maybe our group will do a bit better than what they did in Techno. Mm -hmm. And that's what we see here. And that's kind of the, the norm, really, in breast cancer clinical trials. The control groups seem to do better as we as a collective seem to be doing, doing better with early detection, better therapies, and so forth. OK, thank you. Any more questions? I have a couple of questions. Uh, were patients that had ER positive tumors, were they on antiestrogens during the trial? Yes, we, we uh, basically allowed choice of, of endocrine therapies as well as decisions on radiation therapy to be per local practices. We did give our guidelines. The specific thing we did request was that when those th therapies were used that, they, that our our research agents are be co-administered, okay. so they were given concurrently. And also, did you allow anybody with any residual disease, even an RCB1, would go into this trial? In a sense, we did. We did not attempt to collect RCB data because this, you know, because it was a global trial. But we did look at, and I have, we'll share this information later this morning. We looked at the subset of patients with very small disease in the breast and negative lymph nodes, which is a, a 
proxy, yep. I guess, for RCB1, and okay. we saw the same Same effect. Mm -hmm. And, uh, okay, uh, and did you check, or do you have plan to recheck the HER2 status in that residual cancer? Yeah, one of the th strengths of the, the study, I think, is that we have received a large number of the residual tumor as well as the baseline tumors, and so we are going to be doing extensive correlative studies looking at those sort yeah, of issues. I think I, yeah, I think that's important. One fi final question. Yes, hi, Marisa Weiss, breastcancer.org. Uh, was the adherence compliance to the uh, um, TDM1 equal to or close enough to the continued trastuzumab or dual therapy? It was similar. The, 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 we planned 14 cycles, and 80% of patients getting trastuzumab received 14 cycles. That number was 71% on TDM1, so there were more early discontinuations of the drug, so due, due to adverse events and things. But one of the things that was in the study is because this was being looked at uh, in a potentially curative population, we had very cautious stopping rules for elevations and bilirubin and things like that, probably more than we needed. Uh, so some of that discontinuation is related to the, what I think was appropriate <coughs> caution given the mm -hmm. unknown activity of the drug. But. And in terms of the uh, slightly less adherence compliance to the TDM1 because of those adverse side effects, do we collect patient reported outcomes or sort of? Uh, yes, patient reported outcomes are part of the study and that, you know, this, uh, those analyses are being conducted because they will be part of the package taken to regulatory authorities requesting consideration for approval. So those, that data will be forthcoming as well. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. Well, no, we have to